Hey, uh, let's get in the sermon today. I, I want you to know, I really am excited about this message today. I believe it's for this time. Sometimes, you know, you never know why God delays something or why God puts something on the shelf and then has you pull it out. And I believe for this day and for this season, God has really put this on my heart today. I really do. And I believe it's speaking to you. Uh, you know, when I preach a message, let me just tell you something. It's not just for you. It's God preaches to me before he gets to you. And he convicts me, he changes me, he transforms me, and he prepares me to bring it to you. So I I already know that what God has done for me, but how many of you know right now there's a lot going on in our country? There's a lot of anger, a lot of rage going on in our country right now. People are against people. Uh, anger going on everywhere. You see it on TV. A lot of times you don't even want to turn on the television set because of what you're seeing and everything. On every national channel on sports and all what you're seeing, all the topsy-turvy things that are going on in our world right now. And our world is in a total confusion right now. And isn't that exactly the opposite of what God wants for his people? God is not a God of confusion but a God of peace. And isn't the enemy trying to stir up confusion within our world? And the reason why he's trying to stir up confusion in our world, and I want you to get this in your heart, the reason why he's trying to do that, because the time of the Lord is drawing near. And the enemy knows that God is drawing near, and he's coming sooner than we think. And therefore, he's trying to get the church and the, his people in a state of confusion. And you know what? When you're in a state of confusion, you don't know what voice to listen to. You don't know what voice to follow. You don't know what steps to take. You don't know what to, because you're in confusion. But God is not an author of confusion, but a God of peace. And let me say this to you and write this down in your heart. Don't doubt the voice. Don't doubt the voice. My people hear my voice and they follow after me. The voice is God's word. Don't doubt the word of God. Listen to the word of God. Apply the word of God to your life. Walk out the word of God and stand strong and steadfast in the word of God during these turbulent times because heaven and earth shall pass away, but God's word will never pass. And so how are we going to get through this turbulent time of our life? You have to stand firm on the word of God and don't doubt the verse of the word. Don't doubt the word. Don't doubt the voice. Know that God speaks to his church and that God has a plan and his plan is to prosper you and not to harm you and a plan to give you hope for your future. Jeremiah 29 11. So in saying that, I want to speak to you about hope. Hope to cope. And if you have your notes, you can see this. Hope helps you see the light at the end of the tunnel. Right now, we're in the middle of the tunnel. And we're not seeing the light that we probably want to see right now. Amen. I'll tell you, I kid you not, I, I've never in all my times of ministry seen what's going on right now in our society. People are really walking in anxiety and fear and frustration and anger. They're backlashing on people. They're taking it out on people. Man, if I talk to people that are entrepreneurs in our church, man, they're telling me that, man, it's hard to work with our employees because they're all on edge. They're like a dog with, man, their hair standing up and they always want to bite. That's kind of the world that we're in right now. But let me just tell you, there is light at the end of the tunnel. There is hope. Hope is the breath of fresh air in the midst of your storm. That God wants to bring hope in the midst of your storm. It's the breath of fresh air in the midst of your storm. How many have ever had the wind knocked out of you? Man, I had the wind knocked out of me when I was playing football way back in junior high, and I had the wind knocked out of me. And I'll never forget, I was laying there on the field, and man, I was like, boy, I'm in a trance. I just almost to feel paralyzed. And all of a sudden, at that moment when I thought I was going to die, wham, I caught my breath. And, <gasps> and you know what I've done? It brought hope to me and excitement that I'm going to live. I, I almost like wanted to start pinching myself because all of a sudden I was able to breathe again and take in breath. And the same thing with hope. God says, listen, you don't give up. I will bring the hope in your time of need. I will bring that to you when it's time. And God will bring that breath of fresh air. Hope says, I got this. Hope says, I got this. It's all going to work out. Amen? 
Hope says, I got this. I got this. I'm under control. You think that God doesn't see what's going on around our world right now? God knows. God knows. And here's the great thing about God. God not only knows, but God can change things in the twinkling of an eye. Have you ever thought how awesome and powerful and great our God is? If God can come in the twinkling of an eye, and if God can face his face into the winds and say to the winds, enough is enough, do you not think that God can reach down his hand and say, be still? In Jesus' name. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, God can change the circumstances. But I believe that God's not changing the circumstances right now because you know why? Because if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways, then I will heal their land. What God is calling the church of Jesus Christ to do right now is not to sit on our blessed assurance, Jesus is all mine, but it's time that the church rises up and seeks his face while he may be found and call on his name while he is near and say, Jesus, I'm turning. I'm coming back home. I'm turning back to you, God. And if I do, then God is going to change the situation. You can't expect change if you don't change. It all starts with us. If I ask you a question, I don't want to see a raise of hands, but how many of you, and maybe you're shook in your hand at the TV, or maybe you, you spooled out something at somebody because you're full of rage yourself. And you're wanting everybody else to change. But change doesn't happen until it starts with us. It starts with you. That we as a church have to be the leaders, the forerunners, the pace setters of saying, God, <laughs> the cross before me. Now you got to get this. The cross bread is before me. The world is behind me. I'm going to fix my eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of my faith. I'm not going to be pulled back. I'm not going to be held down. I'm going to go into my promised land and conquer that which God has called me to conquer. Amen. 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 And so listen, hope says, hold on. It's almost over. Several years ago, I won't go back in time, but Jeff, several years ago when I was a youth pastor, Levi, about your age, Jack and Zach, uh, I was a youth pastor, and I loved being a youth pastor. I thought I was going to be a youth pastor for life until Rich Wilkerson changed that and looked at me and said he hated youth ministry. And I thought, I'd never hate youth ministry. I love youth ministry. A year later, I'm in a senior pastor role, right? But I, uh, I, uh, I went to uh, an amusement park with, uh, with my youth group in Kenosha, Wisconsin. And I'll never forget, uh, it was one of those amusement parks, not the, the, the Six Flags where they have the real nice rides. How many of you know when you go to a music park, like maybe you have at Grantsburg, I saw Tamara and them there last year at the Grantsburg Fair, remember that? Those kind of rides are rickety rides, right? And they're just barely hanging on. Those are the kind of rides that I was riding on. And we brought a wristband that all you can ride, all for the whole day. And so I've been on rides. And if you know anything about me, I'm one of those guys that has a weak stomach. How many can relate to what I'm saying, right? I, I, I'm one of those guys that, that has a weak stomach. And so I knew my limit, and I've been riding all day. Man, I was almost walking sideways. I was lean to the left, lean to the right, stand up, fight, 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 fight right? That's, that's what I felt like, right? Lean to the left, lean to the right, stand up, sit down, fight, fight, fight. Because I was a pastor, come on, go on another ride with us. And it was the end of the day. And I'm like, no, I know my limits. I can't do it. Oh, pastor, come on. Talk about peer pressure. You know what those kids started doing, Dave? Man, you're a wimp, pastor. You're weak. Come on, pastor. And man, I fell for peer pressure. And I knew I shouldn't have gone on that ride. I knew it. But I went on it because I was not a wimp. <laughs> right? That competitive blood. So we don't just go on a ride. We go on a ride that was like a saucer. I'll never forget. It's like a saucer. And all it did was spin like that, kind of tilted over on its side, and I was on the outside. And this place was packed because it was a day where you can buy all you can ride for the wristband. So the place was packed. I knew my limits. We started spinning. Boy, I mean to tell you, I was spinning. And I thought, uh-oh. Plop, plop, fizz, fizz. Oh, what a relief it is, right? And all of a sudden, I kid you not, I'm on the outside of the car. You ask my wife. I wish she was here to tell the story. All of a sudden, for those that maybe not, hey, I lost my stomach. 
And I mean to tell you, I pointed my face out towards the crowd. And I mean to tell you, not one time, not two times, three times, I lost it. And I remember the third time when I lost it, all the kids that were in the car with me, there were three other people, kids with me. And here's the words. Pastor, hold on. And you know what they said? It's almost over. I kid you not. Man, I already had it all over. Man. But here's the crazy thing. When I got off the ride, I was walking sideways. People had their heads. No kidding. My wife will tell you the story. They had their heads literally in garbage cans. People were just covered all over. I mean, you should have seen. Ladies had macaroni in their hair. I mean to tell you, it was just crazy. It was yesterday's meal. It was yesterday's dinner. I mean to tell you, it was right there. Whoop, there it is. Whoop, there it is, right? And I remember those kids. It's almost over. You know, let me just tell you right now. Some of you are on a crazy ride. You're feeling dizzy. Your stomach's upset. And you're ready to lose it. I want you to say this with me. It's almost over. Come on, say it again. It's almost over. And some of you are ready to lose it, ready to throw in the towel, ready to quit. But I'm here to tell you, it's almost over. I love this on your notes. Says, Listen, you have to go through struggles and hardships in life to produce something in you. Whenever you go through a struggle, whenever you go through hardships, the first thing that that produces in you is your character. Who are you in the midst of the storm? Are you going to blow up? Are you going to lose your control? Are you going to throw in the towel? What are you going to do? You see, the Bible says in Galatians 6, 9, do not become weary in well-doing for at the proper time you will reap a harvest if you do not quit. But everything that you go through in life, there's a reason, there's a purpose, there's a plan of why you're going through it. Have you ever thought of this? Look at this. Grapes must be crushed to make wine. Man, I don't know about you, but think about that. Grapes must be crushed to make wine. Diamonds form under pressure. Olives are pressed to release oil. A seed must be broken in order to grow. You see, in your life, sometimes in your life, you're going to go under pressure. You're going to go under stress. You're going to have anxiety. But it's not just for a reason that God wants to bring you down, but maybe it's what God wants to bring you up. You see, a lot of times I hear people say, well, what's wrong with me? Why am I going through these tragedies in life? Why does this, that, and the other thing keep happening to me? And we look at ourselves and we say, man, I must be a loser. But maybe you need to reverse the curse and say, hey, maybe I'm doing something right in my life that the enemy's coming against me, and that's why he wants to attack me, and that's why I'm going through these things in life. Right. See, the enemy wants you to believe a lie and say, listen, you're going through this, you're going through that, because of Man, you're not the right person. But maybe in God's eyes, you are the right person. And you're being tested, and the enemy is trying to keep you from your promised land. Sometimes we need to have a Caleb spirit. If you read in Numbers where it says Caleb came back from the 12 spies, and he had a different kind of spirit than the other 10. You see, what negativism will do, it'll rob you of your joy, it'll rob you of your peace, it'll rob you of your contentment, it'll rob you of your relationship with God, because all you will begin to see is the negative things instead of the positive things that are really happening in your life. And God wants us to be focused on Him. You see, listen, God is turning your pain into something beautiful. Even though you can't see it right now, you don't understand it. You don't understand it, but God has taken that and turned it around into something beautiful, an ugly moth into a beautiful butterfly. He goes through that metaphor for stage, and he transforms from a, from a moth into, a, into a, a, a cocoon, into a caterpillar, I mean, from a caterpillar to a cocoon, into a, a beautiful butterfly. Some of you are monarchs that God wants to make you beautifully and wonderfully, but you're going through the pain. You see, God takes the pain. He makes some trust the process. Trust God. You see, the process from getting to point A to point B is sometimes not easy. You see, champions are not born overnight. 
champions, man, have to continue to persevere, to persevere and not quit. I love, and maybe you can frown on me, throw eggs at me, whatever you want, but when I was in my day, how many remember, Billy Jean, up my girl. You know I'm bad, Shamal. You don't know none of that, right? But that was my era. I like Michael Jackson. Keep on. Where's the post up? Don't stop till you get it up. Keep on. You don't know that neither, right? Come on. Come on. Where's Murray at? Murray knows that, right? Murray, there you go, Murray. All right, all right. But you know what? If you look at Michael Jackson, what a sad life. You know, for him to become as great as he was, the king of pop, it just happened overnight. He sacrificed his childhood, and I have an autobiography of there. I got another autobiography of Michael Jordan. I got everything on Michael Jordan. I got everything on Brett Favre. I even got the DVD on Brett Favre. But in order for those three guys to become champions, they had to lay down certain things. And sometimes in your life, maybe God, listen to me, listen to your pastor, hear me closely, closely. maybe right now, God has got you in a place that's saying, hey, I want you to lay it down. I want you to lay it down. You're going through this frustration. You're going through this trial. Are you willing to lay it down for the sake of me? And then I will make you the ambassador, the person that you're supposed to be. And Michael Jackson and Brett Favre and Michael Jordan, all these great athletes and singers, what did they do? They laid something down to become great. And maybe what you have to lay down, get your pastor today. Maybe what you have to lay down, first and foremost, maybe you got unforgiveness in your heart and you have to lay it down. Maybe you have bitterness. Maybe you have resentment. Maybe you have awed against your brother or your sister or your husband or your wife or your co-workers, whatever. There's something that maybe you have to lay down so that God can replace it with something great. A little bit of yeast works through a whole batch of dough, and what you hold on to is going to poison you and bring you down. I don't know about you. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is my strength, and I have to lay down, God, that which, Lord, maybe needs to be replaced with something better. You see, listen, I love this. Troubles are inevitable. They're inevitable. You're, they're going to happen. Some of you can walk out of here today. Man, troubles. Pastor Andrew, the other day, bless his heart. Man, bless Pastor Andrew's heart on Monday. He just had favor in his life Monday morning. Monday afternoon, man, we went back to pick up that favor, and somebody rear-ended him. Just that quick. Was Pastor Andrew looking for an accident? No, that individual wasn't paying attention, nailed in about 65, 70 miles an hour. You see, troubles are inevitable. But here's this. But misery is optional. It's a choice that you make in life. It's a choice that you decide that I'm not going to allow this to bring me down, to handcuff me and hold me back. I choose to keep my head above water. I choose to put my hope in the Lord. It's not how you start in this walk with Jesus. It's how you finish. It's how you finish. You know, it's how you finish the race. And Paul says those words, I've fought the fight, I've kept the faith, I've finished the race. And Paul said those, man, because he went through trials in his life, went days without sleep, with shipwreck, was beaten, was flogged, and yet I've finished the race. I love this. The world is full of voices. How many of you know? How many of you know you hear voices all the time? Voices have choices. Don't doubt the voice. Voices have choices. Choices have consequences. Parents, how many of you ever said this about your kid, your son or your daughter? Man, why did they do that? I still do it now. You say, why? Because choices not only affect the person that had, uh, causes it, but affects the others around it. It's a rippling effect. So your choices that you make, sometimes, let me just say this to you, and I want to be as candid, as honest as I can. Your choices sometimes can be selfish and eye-centered. You're forgetting about the consequences maybe of others. Choices have consequences. It's not just all about you. 
When I was going through my drunken stupor and stupor and my drug addict and all those things that I went through in life, guess what? Man, my choices affected my little brother. It affected my six sisters, and it affected most of all my mother. But it was my choice. You see, listen, what are you going to do when the battles rage, when the struggles hit? What is your choice? Are you going to hang in there with God, or are you going to put your gloves on and start swinging? You see, we can easily claim the words of Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Why does Jesus say you're all your heart? Because your heart is the container or the wellspring of life. Your heart is the container where God lives. He's enthroned upon the praises of your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not unto your own understandings, your own ideas, your own thoughts, your own ways. And you're going to try to do it my way or the highway. He said, but in all your ways, acknowledge him that God... I don't understand. Jehoshaphat, when he was faced with the army that was coming against him, he he said, God, I don't understand. Maybe some of you are right now in that place where you don't understand. Maybe you're walking in that place of confusion, and you're saying, God, I don't understand. But you know what he did? He was at a crossroads in his life. Maybe where some of you are right now, at a crossroads in your life. But you know what he did? He lifted his eyes up the Lord, and he said, God, I don't understand. But here's the key. But my eyes, my eyes are upon you. Sometimes in life, you may not know God. In Psalms 119, verse 18, David said, Open my eyes, Lord. Open my eyes, Lord, that I may know the wonders of your law. God, let me see, Lord Jesus, what you have for me in my life. 2 Kings chapter 6, where Elijah's servant came before Elijah and said, Elijah, man, he went outside and he saw all these chariots and all these horses and all these things that were coming against Elijah and his men. And he came back with fear and terror in his heart. He said, Elijah, Elijah, look, look. And Elijah came out of the tent and he saw the horses and chariots ready to pounce on him to attack him. But Elijah stood there under cool pressure and he didn't get rattled by what was going on around him. He said to the servant, he said, servant, open God his eyes that he may see that there's more of us than they are of them. In your battles, let me say this to you. There is more of God's man angels that are surrounded around you than you are in the midst of your battle right now. God open my eyes that I may see. In Luke chapter 12, I, I love this story. In Luke chapter 12, I told you, man, I'm about, I've been stewing on this sermon for a long time, Harlan, so that, that was all that stuff I just gave you was free. Amen. Amen. <laughs> In Luke chapter 12, uh, Jeff, I I love this portion of Scripture because Jesus is calling for warning and and encouragement. That Jesus desires to warn you, in other words, let you be aware. God doesn't want you to be blindsided. He doesn't want you to be caught off guard. He wants to warn you. And he says this, meanwhile, a crowd, a crowd of many thousand had gathered. So they were trampling on one another. Can you imagine that? Playing the game sardines. You ever done that before? Try to see how many people you can fit in the closet? Man, man, when I was a kid, that's the first time I really had a girlfriend. I held her hand in the closet. Eh, woo, playing sardines. Ah. Her name was Phyllis. Not Phyllis Diller, but Phyllis Cox. Amen. And uh, so that they were trampling on one another. Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, again, first to his disciples, those are around him. Be on your guard. In other words, be alert, be aware, be attentive against the yeast of the Pharisees, which are hypocrisies, right? In other words, be aware of what's happening in our world right now. God is telling us to be aware aware of what's going on around us. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. Lord, give us Mickey Mouse ears to hear. Give us Dumbo ears to hear what the Lord is saying, right? He said, because what? There's going to be those. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed. Get that? There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight. Somebody say amen. Amen. And what you have whispered in the ears of the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. And then he goes on to say, verse 4, 
He said, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that cannot do more, no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after your body has been killed has authority to throw you into hell. Amen. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Fear the Lord. Get ready. Are, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Then he goes on to say, watch these last two verses. He said, I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before the angels of God. If you have your notes there, it's really cool. I love this. Whenever God speaks, you've got to get this in your heart. Whenever God speaks, and especially when it's in red, the Bible says that not one word, Molly, that Jesus said fell to the, to the ground. In other words, Jesus speaks, and he gives you things for information. How many of you know that information is powerful? Amen. Information is powerful, whether good or bad. If you tell somebody something in secret or private, maybe something you've done, and they go out and they tell everybody, what does that do? It affects you. It hurts you. It, 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 man, it maybe assaults you. It brings you down. Information is powerful. And what God is doing, he's giving us information. So let me give you a key or a nugget. I always say when you're reading the word of God, what is it saying to me? How can I apply it to my life, and how can I help others with it? But also, let me give you another nugget. I do this all the time. When the Word of God speaks, it's broken up into different categories. And if you see on your paper, you can see there, number one, these are nine verses. It's broken up into four categories. And the first category, if you look in there, in verses two and three, that is being prophetic. That God is letting you know that, hey, those things that are hidden in darkness will be brought to light. So he's bringing you a word of prophetic. So when you start looking at the word of God, what is God saying for this time, for this hour, for this moment? Is it prophetic? And then you see in verses 4 and 5, it's talking about our witness. What do you mean our witness? Being ready, being prepared, being set up for, that you know that when Jesus appears, you are ready. Another one is 6 and 7. It's being right there. What is it meaning in those verses? It's verses of love. That God is showing you his love. He's speaking those things to the masses. You see, not one word that Jesus spoke fell to the ground. And if you look at 8 and 9, what does he go back to? He goes back to prophesying and making things known or prophetic. And so here it is. I want you to lay it out real quick, and I'm going to go blow through these. Four steps to your hope. Number one, truth revealed. Prophecy, verses three, uh, 2 and 3. What did Jesus say? That he is going to bring to light those things that are hidden in darkness. Truth will be made known. Just be waiting on the Lord. Just be peaceful. Let God work it out. God's timing is perfect. Right now we're ready to erupt and God's saying, just be still and know that I'm God. Psalms 46, verse 10. He said, just be still. In our world right now, we have all this stuff going on around us right now. We we don't know what is truth, what is not truth. We don't know whatever. We can just throw up things in the air, and man, heads I win, tails you lose. That's kind of where we're in right now. And, man, there's so many people that are up in arms, and man, ready to go to war and battle and so on. But God said, wait a minute. Hey, I'm going to bring to light. I'm going to bring to light those things that are hidden. And when I bring them to light, I'm going to bring judgment. And my judgment is worse than your judgment. Let me deal. I'm called the balls and the strikes. I'm the God that's doing things. Listen, God makes your things clear. He'll make it clear. He's going to make it clear. So I want to encourage you. If you're maybe at a place in your life right now and you're feeling frustrated, because all I know to do is pray, that God bring forth the truth. Because the, in the word said, the truth will set us free. God, bring forth the truth. Bring forth that which needs to be brought to light. And, Lord, let it be done in your way. Let it be done in your way. Because, God, when you do it right, everything else turns out right. But I love what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. This is so cool. you got to get this. For what we preach is not of ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and as ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. Now watch this. Uh, you you got to get this in your heart. You, Rich, you got to get this in your heart. He says this, for God who said, let light shine out of the darkness. What does the light do? It reveals or exposes darkness. True story, true story. 
I remember some time ago that, man, when I was going to North Central Bible College, I went to a guy, and I led him to the Lord. His name was Charles. And I led him to the Lord, and leading him to the Lord, man, I said, hey, man, I'm going to stand with you. Uh, he was an alcoholic. I was trying to get him into this uh, alcoholic center and all these things for alcoholics. And I, so I went to his house, and my wife was having a Tupperware party, so I said, I'm going to get out of the house. My wife's got all these ladies there. So I went to his house. I'll never forget this. He lived in probably the worst neighborhood there in Minneapolis. And I went to his house, and it was like the front of it was all boarded up. True story. It was a gray house. The whole front of the house was all boarded up. So I went around the house, and I noticed that there was a doorway there. And, man, I walked into the doorway, and it was as dark as dark can be. I'm not exaggerating. And I'm yelling, hey, Charles, Charles. And, man, nothing, nothing. Charles, Charles. I didn't even know there was upstairs, downstairs. I had no idea. It was that dark. And all of a sudden, the door that was straight ahead, which I didn't know was there, a, a door was opened. And here walked out this Hispanic man with his two kids hanging on to his legs. And I, I'm just being real honest with you. He was half-dressed, and his kids looked like they were starving. And he said, Charles lives up there. And I, I said, where's up there? And he said, there's a string right there. Pull that string. And I pulled the string, and lo and behold, I kid you not, I'm not exaggerating. It was that dark that I couldn't even see the flight of steps going upstairs. So I pulled the string, and I went upstairs. And I'm knocking on the door, Charles, Charles. Finally, I hear this fumbling around. True story, true story. I heard this fumbling around, and I hear this guy coming to the door. I didn't know it was Charles or whatever. But here, all of a sudden, they opened the door. The lights were off, the whole thing. I kid you not. And the guy opened the door, and it was Charles' dad. And as soon as I stepped in, he turned on the lights. Honest, I stand before God. I'm not trying to gross you out, but I'm telling you the truth. Light exposes darkness. When I walked into this dark kitchen, he turned on the lights. And as soon as he turned on the lights, there was millions, and I'm not exaggerating by any stretch of the imagination, of roaches. I walked in, and I could feel them under my feet. <laughs> As soon as he turned the lights on, whoosh, they were like raid. You see, that's what's going to happen in our world when God points his finger on the sin and he brings light to those within. And he says, okay, enough is enough. The truth will be the reveal, and the truth is going to set the captive free. And you that have gone and caused all this pain, you're going to stand before the judgment seat, and I'm going to count you all those things that you have done, and I'm going to make them visible, and the truth is going to set us free. Amen. Come on. Amen. Amen. I love this. Judgment is coming. Truth will be made known. And we will see him soon. Somebody say amen. I got to fly. Your witness tested in verses 4 and 5. What does it talk about? Talk about your witness. Your witness, that's you. Your witness is a reflection of Jesus. So be careful about what others see. Got to be careful. Be careful of what others see. Your witness is living like him. Now, you got to get this. Living like him, preparing preparing, preparing for him, and soon and very soon, leaving with him. Amen? Amen. Leaving with him. Let me ask you a question. Are your bags packed? Are your bags packed? You see, in Psalms 56, verse 11, he said, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? A couple of years ago, my granddaughter, Riley, she's now 11, she came to our house, to our cabin, and she came to see I'm on Papa. And I'll never forget this. I, I'll never forget. And my wife is always playing a joke on her now. And so my, my granddaughter at nine years old comes to our house. She has her suitcase and so on. And so here she is. She's all excited. We brace her. We hug her. And that night we had a great time. But the next morning, man, we had turbulence in the cabin. And the reason why is Riley, who was nine years old, forgot her underwear. I mean to tell you, I kid you not, Jane, she forgot her underwear. And I mean to tell you, do you think she was going to put someone else's underwear on? Or you think she was going to wear them another day? Absolutely not. We had a chaos in the cabin. 
So my wife had to go in from the cabin, go into Webster and go to the dollar store, the family dollar store at that, and buy her some family underwear. And I mean to tell you, her bags weren't packed. And she had, man, a chaos. I ain't putting those on. Man, I'm no way. Ah, no. So every, every Christmas now, Riley said, Amma, what'd you get me for Christmas? Underwear. Underwear. <laughs> and you know, just by her not having that, it threw her into a tailspin. But let me ask you something. Is your bags packed? Are your bags packed that if Jesus comes today, are you ready? Yeah. Or are you going to be empty-handed? Are you going to be caught off guard? Are you not going to have your Bible, the B-L-B-I-E, hidden in the heart that I might not sin against God? Are you not going to be in a relationship with him that you have a communion with God, that you can hear his voice, and that man, my sheep hear my voice and they follow after me? Are you ready? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love it. Being ready, having that readiness before God. Another one is real quick is this, the value of man, that God values you. Let me give you hope that God loves you so much. He loves you so much. Notice Jesus illustrated towards that calling us sparrows. And Walt, you guys, you have a farm. And when I grew up on the farm in milk, and you know the biggest pest on a farm, you know what they are? Sparrows. Man, they make a mess, don't they? they? They leave their little blessings all over the place. And they're not blessed as assurance, amen. They're blessed as a mess, amen. And man, you're sometimes afraid to put your hand on the shelf or this, that, because man, those little stinkers, they've been all over the place. They're not the most pretty of pretty birds. Man, they're not a, canary, a, a cardinal or a canary or, or a blue jay. They're just average brown looking birds. But God points that out to you, that something that may be not as valuable to you is valuable to God. And if God is so concerned about the sparrows, he's concerned about you. Dawn, he, he's concerned about you. Dawn, Dawn, meet Dawn, meet Dawn. Right there, Dawn, Dawn. Look at that, right in the row. Look, check it out. Check it out. But if he's concerned about the sparrows, he's concerned about you. Jesus illustrated the sparrows to show us if he loves them, he truly loves us. Jesus goes deeper than our looks. Got to get this. Than our looks. People love you because of your looks. Give me a Barbie doll girl. Give me a Ken, Ken man, right? I want to be Barbie and Ken, right? God doesn't look at that. Position and even our heart condition. Wow. The greatest news is that Jesus made the world. But the, he loved that world. Your worth in God's eyes has a price that no one can afford, not even Bill Gates. Man, he loves you so much. He loves you. I, I hope you can fathom that today. And Sherry, he loves us so much. Michael, he loves you. Last week, man, you blessed me last week. Man, I still am, am living in last week. I promise you, I still am, buddy. That was, that was amazing. He loves you. Lastly is this, and I close. Take your stand, prophecy. Watch this. During this time in our world and nation, it's not a time to be quiet, but a time to be heard. You know where it be heard first and foremost? Let Jesus hear your voice first. If you're not going to the Lord first with your voice, then guess what? We're out of sync. Let God hear your voice first. I always say that God will speak to you. He will speak to you. Speak to him. God is not a one-way conversation. He speaks back. Let your voice be heard. It's time for us to be Elijah's, the John the Baptist. And the Pauls of the book of Acts and rise up and say, God, count me in. Count me in, God. I want to be sold out and radical for you. I want more of you and less of me. Let our voices be heard and his name be lifted up and exalted so that others may know him and accept him. Man, you know what? Our time is drawing near. 
I probably got maybe six, seven more years being in this pulpit that I'm going to go retread and do something different. But I know that in six or seven years for my life, I have one urgent plan, and that's to see Jesus come to the Lord. I don't care about anything else, material things, this, that, and the other thing. All I want is Him and doing the work of Him. You see, because listen, all those other things don't matter, but when I get to heaven, I can say, man, I led that one to the Lord. I led that one to the Lord. I led that one to the Lord. That's all that matters. Let your voices be heard. Romans 1.16, and that's the close. I want you to do that song, Caught Up in Your Presence. Will you, Andrew? Watch this. Watch what Paul says. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jews, and then the Gentiles, the sinners. I'm not ashamed. I don't know about you, but listen, what you have, you don't have to take a back seat to no one. You got the greatest gift, the greatest prize, the greatest trophy, the greatest answer in your life that satisfies all your needs. It's better than a jawbreaker that has 96 different layers in it. God has you. Listen, we need to be Fox News. We need to be the Fox News, the CNNs, the New York Times newspaper, and let the truth be known that Jesus is alive and is coming back soon. Come on. Come on. There is never, ever, 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 ever people in our time, in our society, that there's the urgency for letting people know about Jesus than ever before. This is the time and this is the hour. You think people right now, they are so vulnerable, so open to the things of God. This is when we need to open our mouths and let people know who Jesus is. Jesus first is coming was a baby. Jesus first coming as a baby. His second coming will be as a man with authority in his hand. Somebody say amen. He's coming back. This Christmas, or this was written for Christmas, this Christmas season, be the church with the good news, not the false news. Let your light shine so that we don't have to drive out or drive away looking for Christmas lights because we have the right lights. We have the right light. This morning, Pastor Andrew, I want to go into that song. and Can you stand with me this morning? I know I took a little time, and I apologize. When I, when I get to preach it, I told you, I could have went to 3 o'clock today, Jeff. You had been going out the door, and I know that some of you are probably sore on your rear, but I, I, uh, I, I just, man, I, I don't want to be an accident when I hit you. I don't want to be a hit and run. I could be a hit and run and give you a five-minute sermon or a theory or this, but I only see some of you maybe one time a, a week, and I want you to leave here encouraged, challenged, and inspired. But this morning... I want us to sing this song, but maybe there's someone here today. And we're not here to embarrass you. We're here to pray for you. Maybe there's someone here today that you say, Pastor, I just need prayer. I just need prayer. It doesn't matter what it's prayer about, but maybe you just need prayer and you want prayer this morning. We just step out as Pastor Andrew. Just begin to lead us. Come on, Pastor Andrew. If you just need prayer this morning, if you just say, Pastor, I need prayer this morning, if that's you, just step out. Just step out. Come on. If you just need prayer, just stay right in here. Come on. If you just say, I need prayer this morning, Pastor. I need prayer. Don't leave the same way you came. We're here to pray with you. We're a family that believes in God, the power of God. This is what it's all about. This is what it's all about. This is where you can be transformed, where you can be introduced to Jesus, where you can do exactly, Jamie, what he said he can do. And so if you need prayer, just come. Just come. Just step out. I need prayer warriors. Come on. My prayer people, come on. Come on, step out. All these prayers. Look at all these people. This lady here, just met her today. She used to come prior to the church. Many of you guys know her. And she just started coming back. And today, God bless you. No, oh, thank you. God bless you today. I mean that. Come on, guys. I need some prayer warriors. Come on, Dan, or Jack and Becky. Come on. There's people all up here. Come on, on. begin to pray. Let's believe with people today. Brett, come on down here with your sister. Come on, Brett. Get down here with your sister. Man, let's pray. Let's believe today. Never want to leave. 
Come on, let God just move this morning. Come on. Oh, I'm not here for blessing. God, just minister right now. Jesus, you don't know me anything more than anything that you can do. I just want you. Come on, God. Just touch these people, God. Just touch them, Lord. Oh, I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. Oh, I'm not here for blessing. Jesus, is you don't owe me anything more than that you can do I just want you now let me pray over you this morning I want to say thank you for being here friends over here Jeff's friends neighbors thank you for being here today I mean that thank you if guys if you can help me tomorrow I need some men you're not going to be cleaning windows stuff but I need some men to help me lift heavy things tomorrow and if you can be here at 10 o'clock it'll probably take you an hour I just need to move tables and booths and stuff tomorrow. So if I can get some men to help me tomorrow at 10 o'clock, that'd be great. Let me pray over you this morning. Father, I thank you for this wonderful congregation. We love them so dearly. I pray, God, that you will impact their life with more of your presence, power, and spirit. That, God, that we can be a light, that we can be a witness, that we can be an example to our coworkers, to our friends, and to our family. That people will sense, know, and feel that there's something peculiar and different in our lives, and that's you. The light of hope. And I pray, God, today that you will bless this congregation. May we be a beacon, Lord God, to those around us. Go with us today. Touch and bless and minister now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you this morning. God bless you. Amen. You can continue to pray, but God bless you. If you can be here tomorrow at 10 o'clock, ladies, to help out, God bless you. Nothing else. Nothing else, Jesus. Nothing else.